disreputable, um, you know, that, that can reflect poorly on uh, their experience of you and their attitudes for you. Uh, and then finally, another potential benefit is establishing competitive parity. Um, you know, if you, again, if you look at the landscape of, of, of your competitors and you see that, uh, you know, your site is sort of up to something, you know, um, you know that, start, that starts to reflect on um, your ability to kind of effectively present yourself and conduct business in, in a, um, a kind of impactful way. So there are some definite cases where, um, you know, a redesign is very, very critical. However, um, those things get talked about a lot. What doesn't get talked about maybe quite as much, it obviously does, but not as often, is some of the costs, and these aren't reasons not to do it, uh, but these are things to consider as, you know, you consider any investment. Um, so obviously they are expensive, not just in terms of dollar cost, but also in terms of people costs and time costs and things, other things you could be doing when you're not doing redesign. Um, obviously very time, time intensive, uh, not just in terms of the project, but building a business case might take months, uh, might take a long time to find a vendor. So for that reason, the benefits of redesign are often delayed. You might not see um, you know, the actual redesign cycle live for six months, a year, two years. So because of that, you know, that's one of the sort of key, the key areas uh, I'm gonna talk about today is what you can do in the meantime <laughs> to kind of help, uh, help get, get where you need to go. And then the final, final cost that maybe doesn't even talk about quite as much is when you're doing a redesign, it's like a 10,000 point A-B test where you're changing so many different things. And those things are difficult to measure. Uh, if you're changing your home page, if you're changing your, your, um, your apply page, if you're changing uh, your program page, whatever those things might be, whatever you can just figure in, um, that's a lot of change. And during that time that you redesign everything, it's very difficult to kind of uh, assess uh, the performance of a specific page against uh, one of the new pages. Partly because they might not even be the same pages anymore. So it can be very difficult to kind of show the, the value and show the actual uh, impact of, of, the, of the work that you've done. So considering the costs and benefits, when does a redesign make sense? Um, some things that are difficult kind of like optimize your way out of or kind of fix and patch uh, are obviously things like the experiences fractured and disjointed. Layouts are, are poorly designed. Um, you're kind of fighting with the system. It's, it's that, that feeling. Mobile experience is poor. So if you, as you kind of um, as your device size changes, if the experience doesn't uh, effectively kind of um, modify uh, itself to, to fit the, the, the mobile experience, it's probably a good sign that there's something structurally happening that you're not going to be able to fix. And then finally, changes are, are hard to make. Uh, if you don't have the tools that you need, you don't have the um, the layouts that you need in order to get. Um, a really, really strong design, this really strong design. You're kind of fighting with the system, you're fighting, you're fighting with it all the time, you're never able to get uh, the result that you want. However, um, those things are true of a lot of people. We hear that all the time from our clients as they say, I can't make the changes I want, I'm always fighting with it. Um, there is actually a lot you can do in the meantime, even when those things are true. Um, because a lot of times we'd like to live in a world where we have access to all the money and the tools that we want, but sometimes we don't. So if the underlying st structure is not effective and you, um, you can't sort of, you know, kind of tear it up and start again, um, there's multiple things you can do right now that will have a demonstrative and positive impact. So some of the reasons why it's useful uh, to start making changes to your site um, before a redesign, why it's useful to actually have some kind of like investment in, in that is, First of all, you see an immediate result. Rather than waiting for a resign, we might be you know, literally waiting um, until the kids are out of college or, or something along those lines. Um, you see your results right away. You also realize the benefits at a lower, lower cost. Um, you know, obviously hiring an agency or getting any kind of redesign project underway, um, you know, that's a very, a very time intensive uh, prospect. Whereas making optimizations is actually typically very relatively cheap and fast. It also helps you gain agency and control. So if you're, if you're making optimizations to the site rather than kind of wholesale, wholesale changes, it helps you gain the power that you need um, to uh, know your site well. So even if you do decide to do a redesign, you're coming to that redesign with knowledge where people might be asking you, uh, what's wrong with your site? Or what have you tried? Um, you can tell them, these are the things that I've tried. I know my site pretty well. 
I know what the issues are, and I know um, I have some of the knowledge of, of what uh, makes a, a better UX for my site. And just in general, developing a culture of, culture of improvement. We talk to a lot of folks who say, there's nothing I can do. <laughs> my site's kind of, you know, it's broken. I can't, I can't really do much about it. But it's actually often not true. Developing an internal culture of, of continuous improvement um, helps you kind of gain that sense of power over your site if you're not kind of helpless, but instead you actually have the ability to, to affect change. And then finally, preparing effectively for a redesign. At, any, at some point, you're going to be doing one, two years from now, five years from now. The more you've done to your site to improve it, the more you come to that, that project empowered and knowing, um, you know, knowing where to start, knowing where to step in, and giving, uh, whether you do it internally or with the vendor, giving the folks who are going to be doing that work the knowledge they need um, to have a really, really strong understanding of the site's issues. So what tends to stand in the way for people doing um, ongoing optimization? Because we, we all know we shouldn't be doing um, but why don't we? Well, some of the biggest problems are lean team woes. So the common challenge is out of time. I don't have resources um, to uh, make changes to my site on a regular basis. Uh, I can't change design, design's locked in. Um, or I'm not a designer anyway. I don't really have the expertise or the, the knowledge to, to make these changes. If you're making them in an arbitrary fashion, I'm not sure which ones I should be making. Uh, so how do I know which ones to make? However, in a way, it's kind of like the perfect becomes the enemy of, of the good. Is that you know when you're in that state of stasis and not not, change, not changing things, uh, obviously the site itself continues to be added to. <laughs> it does. The site is not getting better. The content becomes a free for all. Many, many people are contributing to it, and it's not really kind of governed or organized in an effective way where. The changes that you're making are strategic and deliberate. Um, they're just changes. And then a third thing that happens when you're in that state is, you know, Google Apps is there, but it's more of a guilt engine than a recommendations engine. It's kind of, you, you sometimes you're scared to look at it, almost like you're scared to look at your garage, because uh, you know there's something scary in there, maybe there's something helpful in there, uh, but you kind of cease to kind of have, to treat your site like a, um, like a tool or like a, a strategy tool. It's kind of just a place you put your content. And that leads to the last piece, which is, no real strategy or way forward. Um, you know that there's something that you need to fix, but you don't necessarily have a deliberate approach to, to doing that. So I'm gonna talk about some steps you can take. Um, and these are examples. There are other things you can do. I'm gonna talk about UX specifically, but these same principles can apply to SEO, can apply to accessibility, they can apply to performance. Uh, any, anything that you see that's in your way that you want to remove as an obstacle. So when we think about making progress um, toward a better user experience on our current site, you definitely don't need to be a designer. And you don't have, even have to have full control of the page to improve UX. You can start with some simple principles that are almost always true uh, about user experience. Um, and that is focusing on a few basic concepts. These aren't the only concepts. But there are a few basic concepts that will meaningfully change <laughs> your, your site on a, on a sort of weekly, daily, monthly basis. And some of the ones I want to highlight are reducing, simplifying, and emphasizing. We all know these are true. I'll we'll talk about some specific ways that we can, we can use these simple principles to improve um, with our sites. So the UX guru, Steve Pru, says um, one of the best things that you can do for UX is just get rid of stuff. Kind of like the garage example, just clearing things out. Users are constantly fighting with us presenting more information than they want. Um, if race is not in the order that they want, too much of it, especially on mobile. So getting rid of half the words on every page and getting rid of half of what's left. Uh, a kind of ruthless program of, of defenestration and reduction. Yeah, yeah. So it's actually true, and this is where learned helplessness, when we're in that state where we don't know what to change or we're afraid to change something or we've kind of gotten used to not changing something, is there, it doesn't actually require a UX certificate or a fancy title, when in doubt, cut it out. Using your gut. Um, like, I don't think anyone's going to call this a great UX, most likely. If it feels long, it is long. Um, when you're looking at it, the other thing that's very important is, even if you're in an enterprise like B2B situation, um, and most of your customers use desktop, still, to look at it on mobile, look at it on the smallest screen possible and just see what a torturous, painful challenge that can be for people, um, especially as often modern design means very long narrative pages that can be quite overwhelming for people. 
So look at your site first on mobile for many reasons, but particularly to understand the length and the amount of information you're presenting them. And whether that is, if you're actually telling them things they need in the right order, or if you're actually kind of giving them a sort of overwhelming experience. So that's, that's another sort of element. Clear, definitely breaking up long paragraphs. And we might think of long paragraphs as like five sentences. Sometimes it's like two <laughs> or three. Um, you know, especially in a mobile device, uh, a few words, a hundred words can appear very large. Uh, so the more that we break things up into little chunks that people can digest and understand better. The vast majority of people on the web don't really read. We just sort of uh, scan and we all know this about ourselves. So breaking those things up. The other kind of key elements of reduction are using headings and bullets. And these all seem like common sense, but we see all the time that they get missed. So just taking the same kind of flow of content, especially in deeper pages that get neglected, often they do, um, adding headings, adding bullets, breaking it up um, so that it feels like um, you know, people can, can scan it in one second or they can take two minutes and read the whole thing. So that's kind of like the dual lens that you always want. You always want to give the people that two second scan so they can kind of get the idea of it, the gist of it. Um, then they can, they can dig in if they want to. And they're probably going to dig in if they understand the gist of it. And then finally, consolidating items, consolidating um, content, consolidating evidence, putting important content at the top. Even at the very top of the page, you might just summarize, this page is about it, it's very long. Just to help people understand, um, you know, do I want to commit to this? Do I want to read this? Is this useful, valuable information? Or the key, the top three or four points at the very top. So for years, it's been very um, fashionable, maybe even sometimes in Jackson done this once or twice, uh, to create very large menus um, and lots of options. Put everything on the table, just spread it all out and give people all the options. What I've noticed personally from um, many, many user tests is that people have a visceral, kind of like psychological adverse reaction to that. So when they're presented with everything at once, um, they, just, they just get frozen, they get stuck, and they get stressed immediately. So the more we can kind of selectively show people a small number of items, Better. And that's kind of, it seems like common sense, but it's so easy to do. We think we have so many programs, we have so many products, we have to show everything. But do you? The more, we, especially with we use mobile devices, we realize we're uh, trained now to kind of drill down by the, the scan across. And that's often the most effective way to do it, is to get people, give people an entry point, a first place to start. Uh, and from there, they can decide whether they want to continue, whether they want to explore laterally, however they want to uh, make their way through the, through the site. So that's reduction. Of course, I didn't cover every element of reduction. We get the idea. None of these things require um, deep knowledge of the subject area. They require you to take a common sense approach to your content, look at it objectively. Maybe you have a friend or a coworker who doesn't know the page that well, look at it, um, and, get, and start to think about ways that you can um, bring it down into a manageable amount. The second one is kind of related, which is simplification. I mean, who doesn't want that? Very few people will stand up on this podium and say, complicate your site more. It seems kind of obvious. Um, but bringing all the key information that people need into one place, making it very easy to scan. So fewer options, consolidating content, turning like, text into table, for, for example, um, turning content into bullets, using callouts, little kind of, leaving a little bit of color background for something that is more important or, or different um, that, uh, <clears throat> that you want to highlight. And I'll show you an example of a callout in, in a second. So I'm going to use a few higher education examples, but they're not, you know, these, are, these principles can apply to absolutely any sector. So when I, I've shown this page actually to um, prospective students as part of the user test before, um, and the reaction is usually, you know, wow, amazing. So you're like, what do I do? Um, I don't understand. <laughs> There's a lot of content here. Um, and sometimes when we look at a page as experts in our content, we think this is easy. There's not that much to, to know here. But they read it like, It's very, very important um, to realize that our users are, are just not naturally experts in the content itself. They are going to be starting from scratch. And we need to guide them through like a, a Hansel and Gretel breadcrumb trail to get them where they want to go. So here's an example. It may, not, it may not be high design, but you get the idea of chunking like a table of costs into one short little piece of equation. Don't even need any text to explain it. Um, a little, a couple of call-outs on the side to highlight some of the key things that otherwise would get buried in the text. If you have to read it to find it, you probably won't find it. 
So just taking a bit of a visual approach to, um, to the information, can I take this information and instead of presenting it in a Proustian narrative, can I turn it into four chunks that people can really get and understand very fast? The third UX principle is emphasizing, this gets, this gets forgotten a lot or missed a lot, is it's not enough to make things simple. We actually have to like tell people what to look at. So we have to help users understand what's important and where to look. We are lazy, everyone is lazy, it's just part of our human nature. Um, we want to be able to take the content that is critical uh, and use size and color and space to draw the eye toward it. That's one of the value of things like CTAs or even encapsulating content in you know, color, a different size, whatever it might be. These things, you might sometimes look at a design and think, why are they doing that? Why does this need to be a different color? It's because of the principle of encapsulation. The, th the things that stand out to us visually, we jump, our eyes jump toward them right away. And that's the kind of thing that we want to be drawing people's eyes and people's attention to right away. So put things that are important at the top, um, use size and color to draw the eye toward the key things, the top things, and use highlighting and encapsulation. Um, you don't have to use blank tag if you don't want to, probably not the best idea, but in some way, um, disrupt people's typical cognitive flow to get them focused on the key stuff. So this is an example, none of these are made up, they're all real. You might even recognize them, probably not in your own sites, I would hope. Um, but it's a common thing. It's very true that people often look at their homepage or their about page and they say, those look pretty good. But then if you start looking deeply into, let's say, your software company, your resources, if you're a university, you look at your deeper program pages, you almost certainly see something like this. And that's where the challenge comes in for users, because they often need a lot of information to make a decision. They're not just going to look at your top level pages. So if we take that same content and think of ways to break it up, use big headlines, um, wrap things in a, in a color to kind of give people the, the sort of key information they need, maybe use a, an image, and not just a decorative image, an image that actually, oh, did you have a question back there? Oh, just now. <laughs> Uh, not just a decorative image, an image that actually reinforces what the content is to help people always understand what they're looking at at all times. If you think about like simplifying it, it's not just about making things easy, it's about kind of reducing the amount of intellectual effort required. Almost treating, treating the uh, user the same way that we want to be treated as like spoon feed it to me, give me the information I need easily and quickly without very much um, fluff. So one of the biggest challenges and one of the reasons that people often decide to do redesign is my CMS sucks. Um, it's not Drupal, it's another CMS. Um, I can't change anything as I like my whoever made this is just is locking me in. I can't do the things I need to do. Very common problem, and it's a real challenge. And nothing I've said here today precludes the idea of actually doing a redesign, because sometimes when you lock in, you can't make changes. But even when you're in that state, We've had people say to us, um, our redesign is two years away, so I'm just gonna let the site be, and I'm just gonna step away, <laughs> and you know, let it kind of blow up, because there's no point of doing a redesign in two years, but there's always something to do. So this is an example of a, another page with just a, a real wall of, of text that I think the vast majority of people, 90 plus percent of people, aren't gonna read unless they're highly motivated. Um, if we have a strong designer and a CMS that is capable of uh, making changes, then we could probably solve this problem fairly easily with some like changing mockups and coming up to a, to a good um, understanding of what the, the new version would look like, but sometimes we don't have that. So we might do something that may not be dramatic um, for us, it might look very similar, but it actually makes a big difference. So just cutting this, I should cut this text down to about half. Um, bolded the first sentence. The first sentence here didn't really make a lot of sense, so I just completely changed that. Um, and thinking, thinking through, you know, how can we, with very simple, kind of non-sophisticated tools, start to tailor the experience in a way um, that helps people get what they need quickly. Less is, less is going to make a huge difference. Uh, a bit bigger size is going to help people understand. You don't have to read all that stuff over there, you just have to read that first sentence and you get the idea. So all of these things are designed to kind of reduce the intimidation factor of making changes or, or design, and also provide a sense of purpose, like you can do this. Um, and there's a variety of things that you can do on your site 
It doesn't have to be pages of content. It could be navigation. Uh, it could be the images that you choose, whatever those might be. But starting with some of these high impact areas, um, so your top pages, um, the top kind of user journey, all those different things. And if you're not sure what to change, a really useful thing you can do is, well, you can look at competitor sites or example sites, whether you're competitors or competitors, and just kind of, you know, that starts to give you ideas right away. You say, oh, that's how those guys are. I like that. I'm use that. Or doing a simple usability test. That's often, a lot of times, if you're stuck on what to do, a usability test will give you more ideas than you have time to do. It'll probably give you years worth of ideas by sitting down with two or three people. It's like, oh my god, I never thought that was a problem. And you'll see things you wouldn't have seen before. And then finally, shooting for better, um, not perfect. If it's 20% better, that's better. Your site most likely has thousands or maybe even millions of visitors a year. Um, if every single one of those visitors gets a little bit of a better experience, that's a massive uh, win in terms of scale. So many of you may have done these before, but just, just as an example of uh, a usability test, again, like UX and like many of these other subjects, you don't have to be a deep subject matter expert to do a good job on a usability test. You can do a simple thing like pulling a uh, colleague who's maybe not familiar with your site aside, or finding, um, you know, matching a pizza and a, a student, um, and that could be part of the course or of your, of your, of your usability strategy. Of course, you should pay them well for that, but uh, giving them a task, like find a product, find a program, find a program that's interesting to you, you know. Uh, find whatever it is, whatever thing about your site that, you, that is your sort of top goal. Um, sit down with them, whether it's in a virtual setting or, per, or an individual uh, in-person setting, and just watch what they do. Hopefully record what they do. This will give you often more ideas than you know what to do with, and give you recorded evidence as well that you can bring to your leadership, can bring to the owners of the budget to say, here are some problems on our site, and these are some things that we want to, want to fix. The other thing you can do when doing these ability tests is just, if you're not sure what to test, you can just ask them, What's your impression? Tell us, tell us in, in your, you know, what are the first things that come to your mind? What are the first five adjectives um, that you think of when you look at the site? If you could change one or two things, what would those be? It's very often useful to say, I think at the bottom, to have users review not just your site, maybe one or two competitor sites as well, because that gives you a baseline. If they say like, you know, your site is good, but I really like what they do in this other site, that also helps you bring a uh, business case back to maybe your leadership or, uh, or makes, makes, if you hold the budget to make decisions about where to spend, spend that money, um, the more we can say, yes, this works, this does not work, uh, that's always helpful. That makes evaluation more tangible and it gives you a baseline to say, yep, I can see this is working. Instead of just like feeling like it's working, you have evidence that it works. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is, the important part is, you know, we can make a lot of changes on our site, but unless we have a, a kind of program to operationalize it, we might get demotivated. Uh, maybe other priorities will take over, and then we kind of end up, you know, two months later or six months later in the same spot that we were before. After a burst of, you know, excitement, like, you know, January, we all go to the gym. I certainly did. Uh, and then you kind of maybe fall out of that practice a little bit. So how do you kind of make sure to keep going? So the smaller, the better sometimes. Um, and not every goal has to have every element of the smart, um, you know, the, the smart rubric. It could be just, I want to improve one page a week. Just start, start with, with anything, whatever, whatever it is. Maybe you say like, look, I'm so overwhelmed, I have meetings day after day, I don't have time to think about this. I'm just gonna work on three pages a quarter. Whatever it is, that's still three pages a quarter working on before. Improving one strategic page or section um, a quarter, whatever length of time that is. Choose something, stick with it, and keep working on it. The other thing is, the more it looks like a project, the more likely that you are to do it. Um, the more, it's like anything. If you write down, you know, I'm, you know, I plan to you know, exercise, take two 2,000 steps of, um, every every week, or uh, that's not every steps, it's like maybe 20,000 steps, that's what makes much sense. Uh, so when you kind of treat it like a project, you roadmap it out, you maybe plan, what am I going to do this week, this year? Uh, the more it becomes something real and tangible that you're actually going to do something about. And then the second kind of corollary to that is baking in accountability and measurement. If you're not measuring the changes in some way, you might also get demotivated. You think, why am I doing this? Am I actually making a difference? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. 
And then, of course, be open to adjustment. You might start out with one idea of what should change after a week, but then six months later, you've done a few usability tests, or you've looked at some analytics, and you've just, I, I actually don't think this is the right place to invest. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot, I'm going to change what I'm going to improve. So everybody wants to measure. Everybody feels guilty they're not measuring well. Most of us do, I think. Um, you know, we look at bounce rate, we look at time on page, we think, what does that mean? Is that good? Is it good? Is high bounce rate good? Is low bounce rate good? What does that mean? So we can absolutely use the tools at our disposal in Google Analytics or you know, whatever tool you use. But there might be other complementary ways of collecting analytics that, that might be equally powerful and actually more useful to you. Um, you know, if you're, if you're a lead-oriented site, you can use conversion rate, that, that's absolutely possible. You can also use quick page surveys, like was this page useful? Especially if you have a um, page that's, that's not like a slam dunk conversion, it's just kind of leading people to the next step. So was this a useful page to you? How would you rate it? You know, zero to 10, whatever that might be. Another thing you can do that sometimes people neglect because it doesn't feel like analytics is just doing simple highlight tests. Like you can use user testing to assess what's wrong, you can also use user testing to see what you fixed. Um, so, you know, being a bit facetious here that pizza plus student slash coworker equals cost effective digital strategy, um, having a, a little bit of a budget, you know, I think compensation is fair to, for, for any kind of testing, um, will let you not only um, kind of measure and test effectively, but it also gives you a lot of data to come back with, especially if you report it and say, like, I, I had this idea, this quarter we're going to improve um, our IoT product pages, whatever that, whatever it might be. Here's what we did, here's, here's the, the test that we ran, and here's what we can see as a result. Many user testing tools are not only qualitative in nature, they also offer quantitative ways of measuring. Uh, for example, Optimal Sort allows you to um, chart out um, the success of uh, different tasks, so you can actually come back with some quantifiable. A lot, of, a lot of folks in leadership, they want to see data. Uh, they're not convinced when you just give them anecdotal um, kind of stories from users. So you can get that, that sort of uh, qualitative and quantitative data uh, from testing. So uh, in summary, I mean, it kind of seems simple, right? Is it, but it, why isn't it the case that we're doing it? It's because, you know, there are many factors that kind of lead us to think that redesigning the site is the only way that we can really affect change. It's sort of become the dominant paradigm. We uh, spend 100,000, 500,000, whatever it might be, uh, have a beautiful site, uh, and then largely kind of let it get worse <laughs> over the next five years, and then start again. Um, the ability to change that approach, change that narrative, so instead of letting it kind of fall down or fall apart, we instead treat um, any entry point, whether it's now or after a redesign, as an opportunity to keep, keep momentum going, keep it going, not let this thing slide into, um, to become an unorganized mess. Again, the better off will be. You do not need um, to hire a vendor. See, I, I am a vendor, I should probably tell you the opposite message, but uh, I think that it's absolutely the case that we, we can do so much on our sites and add so much value um, in a very simple, common sense way without a tremendous amount of uh, subject matter expertise. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Comments? Hi. Are there any, like, I don't actually know, you know, the other Drupal modules that do quick surveys and stuff like that? Yeah. We've looked at Drupal modules. What we've usually found um, the most effective. Um, tool is usually Hotjar. Like, there's lots of there's lots of great tool, tools out there, um, but Hotjar is good because it's not that expensive. It also integrates with Drupal. It's just a little standard JavaScript. So there's like a yeah, you could use any tool to kind of integrate that. Uh, it includes surveys. It includes uh, heat maps. It includes uh, a, a wide variety of different tools um, in a fairly in, 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 inexpensive package. Um, you can also choose to just have it for a month or two. Um, if you don't want to pay for it the whole year, so you can kind of, you know, use it when you, when you need to use it. Drupal modules aren't quite as good. Um, they're usually, just because the nature of Drupal isn't 
necessarily to have um, you know, uh, a really, really strong key mapping tool. Uh, it's, it's more of a, a facilitator of better, sort of best in breed third party tools. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, how do you convince people who really like lots of words that they don't need lots of words? Uh, that's a very good challenge. So, getting stakeholder buy in or like getting over people's traditional views of content is definitely a challenge. Um, one of the things that we found quite useful and effective is um, kind of a combination of data and a little bit of maybe peer pressure is a, is a, a fair word. If you can organize a short workshop um, that hopefully even includes them, um, where you can actually uh, you know, gather people together to talk about some of the challenges on the site, and uh, you know, that can often be a lever if you kind of get people to start to, start to think differently, or even just to start to see that, hey, I'm the only one who thinks this way. Um, and then obviously, like, user testing can make a huge difference in a way that analytics often doesn't because of the subjective nature of what people can say as well. Um, it's on a page, you know, help me understand what that means. Um, a targeted user test or a targeted kind of um, uh, survey will often give you a lot more kind of like tangible um, ammunition for that argument. Cool, thank you. Thanks so much.